In all of the lectures so far, I've been focused on stirred tank reactors. In this lecture, you're going to see some examples of, of, of alternative bioreactors. And we'll particularly go into more detail in the airlift reactor, which is, is quite often used and also has a long standing history of the northeast of England. Now, besides that, you should also know the, the key selection criteria. So if you presented a certain scenario, what kind of reactor would you select and why? Now, there are a number of reasons to not pick your standard stirred tank reactor. And, and one of the most common reasons is when you're dealing with large volumes. So think of, for instance, in wastewater, where you have a lot more water that you can cope with and then you will see there are particular designs that are, are a lot more beneficial compared to a stirred tank bioreactor. There are also reasons when you're working with cells that are sensitive to either heat, because if you remember when they, they, they grow, there's a lot of heat that's being generated, or cells that are sensitive to shear stress. Uh, so think, for instance, of microorganisms that grow particularly slow, you can have filaments. Those are the type of ones that Particularly when you're thinking of scaling up the reaction, you might want to look at other designs for those. And besides all of that, the other uh, reasons for, for picking something else, you've seen this example where you use these single use plastic reactors. Financial reasons obviously also play a role. So think of, for instance, when you're producing a very small quantity. So economically speaking, it might be easier just to buy the single use reactor. Or think of when you're working with something where you get a lot of uh, loss when you're, a lot of the water is being evaporated or other kind of financial constraints that you might have. So here you can see two examples of uh, reactors that both work on mechanical agitation, just like a stir tank reactor. So the first one is a torus shaped reactor, which is a horizontal ring shaped tube. So you can see it has four different compartments and they are connected through pipes. Now, what is the main main advantage of using this one? So you can achieve a very high cell density. So and when you're working with uh, with slightly viscous media, so I remember this example of xanthine gums, you can get really really high efficiency with those. So that would be an example, especially high viscosity media, when you would pick the torus shaped reactor instead. Now, the second one relates to, as I said before, especially in the case of wastewater, you would be tempted to use another type of reactor. In this case, you will see you will use a rotating disc. So you use something which is plastic, so the bacteria can stick to it quite well. So it goes around and then it scoops up uh, media which contains nutrients from the liquids. Then there's a period where they will be without oxygen but they will be allowed to grow and then it goes in for a second round where they pick up more nutrients from the media. Um, so obviously this works really well uh, because you need relatively less volume for your reactor, but you also have to imagine that this requires very trained personnel because it's a very specific design. And the same uh, is the case for the torus shaped reactor. The two examples that you've seen in the previous slides, they're all focused on mechanical mixing still. And mechanical mixing had these drawbacks of generating heat and causing more shear stress. So the example here uh, where we're going to start to talk about what an airlift reactor is, they look at non-mechanical mixing. And this non-mechanical mixing works as follows. So as you can see, you have a particular tube into which the air goes in. And because you're working with compressed gas, you will see that the velocity of like what goes up is higher compared to what you have around it. So because of this uh, difference in velocity, you will see that you will get distribution uh, throughout the liquid and mixing will take place. Now, because of these high speeds and because you're working with the gas, you will see that it's always built like a bit like it's wider at the top than it is at the middle. So you need a disengagement zone. So when the gas goes in very fast, it needs some time to kind of expand. And then you will see you will always have a down camera into which the liquid kind of goes down. Um, so this is your typical design of an airlift reactor. And here you can see some of these general characteristics of an airlift reactor. So why would you use it? So you can see that the energy input is traditionally less than a stirred tank reactor and it's easier to scale up. So particularly, uh, and you've seen this example where I, in, this, in the page where you can see about corn, you see these towers that were like 60 meters high. Um, so there are some advantages when you scale them up. And because there's no mechanical mixing, 
these are particularly work particularly well for for um, cells that are sensitive to shear stress and in the case of corn you were looking at filaments filaments they grow out of fungi they grow really slowly and because they're really slowly and because they are aligned in a certain way they're very sensitive to shear stress and that's why this airlift uh, reactor was a very good example of that now you would have seen that like the way it mixes is because the bubbles they rise faster than the surrounding liquid so you kind of get uh, this distribution of the liquid uh, but there is one key factor which you take need to take into account so the key design parameter so it should be the one you start off with is the size of the downcomer so the downcomer is you have your liquid going up but then obviously your liquid will need to come down as well uh, and when they go down there will be a period where they are going to be without oxygen so if you're working in a quite small scale reactor, that's not such a problem. But if you're working with these bigger reactors, so think of, for instance, these towers, which are like 60 meters high, then this is a critical design parameter. So you will need to calculate if the cells can last that long without having access to oxygen. So if you want to know more about why using airlift bioreactors, the link to the paper below is a very good one, which describes these reasons. So we've seen for, before that there are problems with shear forces in traditionally stirred tank reactors. Um, but what I would also like to highlight is that the OTR, so the oxygen transfer rate and uptake, can be higher because of the gas-liquid interface that we have, which is higher when you have more of those bubbles in an airlift reactor. Uh, but a very important one, if you look to the scheme on the right, so what I've highlighted in blue uh, and the one below that, which are almost straight lines, these both relate to airlift reactors. And on the y-axis, you would have the performance. On the x-axis, you have the oxygen transfer rate. So you would see that the performance is not much affected by the oxygen transfer rate. Uh, but the other two, which relate to traditionally stirred tank bioreactors, you see there's a steep downward tra trajectory, which is not something that you would want. So here you can see this effect with the scaling up, that this is easier to achieve and that it's more consistent when you're using an airlift reactor, which is also a very important reason for using it. The final uh, example that I'm going to show you are membrane bioreactors and these were often used in the food industry. So particularly uh, within Asia for making soya and some other uh, biological products. And what you do in that case is that you mobilize the bacteria or the enzymes or the microorganisms that you work with. So you mobilize them onto the cell walls and then they're embedded into some kind of porous matrix. So this is relatively easy to scale up in the sense that you just build different cassettes. So you put one after the other, so you can just make it better as you go along and it will flow through like that. Um, but the disadvantage obviously with that is that everything will need to flow through. So especially the longer it gets, the higher the risk of clogging is. So you get pores that uh, are blocked with substances. You might get like a buildup of toxic products within your reactors. So they're quite difficult to maintain. So particularly working with large volumes, that's not very suitable. But the advantage of using those for particular applications is that you get a direct separation of the product and the bacteria because they're mobilized in the cell wall. So that makes it easier. But it also sees that the productivity is quite high. So it's relatively easy to um, get like a high cell. The four criteria are really looking at what, kind, what your choice of reactor is. Um, but you will see some of them are interchangeably linked, or so I would say in, in practice is really free. So the first one relates to what are the constraints imposed by microorganism growth. So first of all, you need to have a look at how fast the growth is. Is the growth faster, you would be leaning more towards continuous reactors. Uh, if it's slower, then another system might be more appropriate. You would need to see whether the cells are sensitive to shear. So we've seen an example where if they're sensitive to shear, an airlift reactor might be a better example. And then the second one relates to the constraints posed by the medium. So you will see in general, this is not such a problem for uh, bioreactors because most of them are based on, on aqueous systems. So there are not necessarily a lot of problems with viscosity. It might be the case for foaming, but it's less relevant. But you would see that if you're working with a viscous medium, so I've seen in examples of these torus-shaped reactors, they might be more suitable for something where you're working with high viscosity, such as sandline gums. The first ones are related to the constraints imposed by biochemical process data, and really that's kind of linked to the first point. 
Uh, but here you would also have to consider as things such as the, the pH, the temperature, so they're also kind of linked to what the microorganisms prefer. So you would have to see whether they're able to survive in a wide pH range, what kind of temperatures they can tolerate, but also the growth rate kind of uh, is an S factor. Now the fourth point, and this is a very important one, and this is actually the location. So what are the health and safety regulations in the location you're at? How can you dispose of the waste that you're producing? What, or what's the climate that you're working on? So would it be better to work on in a climate that's relatively humid, high temperature or not? And what's the availability of water? So as we've seen before, you need a lot of cooling water. So you need to make sure that you have a lot of access to cooling water, but also that you can dispose of it appropriately. And then the other thing which is intrinsically linked to this is the link uh, to transport. So is it easy to transport your product to wherever you want them to go to? That you have learned from this lecture. So I've presented a couple of examples of perhaps less common but still very important designs for bioreactors and we've gone into more details in the air, on the airlift reactor. So you should be able to know how this one works, how it operates, what are the key design parameters and in what circumstances you would use those. With the other ones you don't need to know necessarily all the details about how it works, you should just be aware of what other uh, designs are out there. And then you should have a rough awareness, like if you're presented with a particular scenario, what are the key criteria for selecting your reactor? Because if you remember from uh, the first lecture, I said that, that like at least 50% of the costs are dictated by what reactor design you select. So it's a very important step in the process.